My name is Rich Bowen, and it is my honor and privilege to be presenting the keynote today at ApacheCon Asia 2022. I am an Apache board member, and I've been a member of the foundation since 2001, and I'm currently serving as the vice president of conferences. In my professional life, I've served as a open source community manager for the last 15 years or so. And I want to share with you a few of my uh, thoughts about nurturing community growth. I'm going to start with a quote from a longtime member of the Apache Software Foundation. And this quote is from October of 2000 and he was talking within the context of one of the projects at Apache it was the cocoon project and he said this quote that you'll see on the screen good ideas and bad code build communities the other three combinations do not now what he's saying is that communities spring up around problems to be solved and some general agreement about the direction in which the solution might lay. So those are the good ideas, but the bad code aspect of it can be a little bit hard to understand. What he's saying is people are only going to come help if there's something to be done. If you show up with the problem already solved, then no one has any incentive to come help you, and that makes it hard to build a community. So what Stefano is saying here is that you shouldn't try to solve all the problems for the community. Rather, you should leave some space for them to work, some space for them to participate and feel ownership in the solution. Because if you've already solved the problem, there's no shared goal. Communities form around shared purpose. Now, before I get into some of these tips, I want to share another idea around open source communities. This is from the Open Infrastructure Foundation, and they codify this as the four opens. And these are the four pillars of an open source project. Now, the first one of these is sort of the, the minimal that defines open source. That is that it is under an open source license. Now, the OSI, the Open Source Initiative, defines what licenses are acceptable as open source licenses. And if you release a project under one of those licenses, it is, by definition, open source. But in order for a community to actually be an open project, we have these other aspects. One of them is open design which means that discussions about what we're planning next happen in public, with everyone participating, everyone able to see what is coming. The next is open development, meaning that the actual code changes are also visible to the entire community and up for discussion and debate and contribution. And the final one of these is the one I'm going to be focusing on primarily today, and this is open community. The other aspects of my talk, the other things that I'm going to mention, are all around how to foster an open community, because open communities are the ones that grow, whereas if you don't focus on being open, you're just going to stay with the group that you have right now. Now, at the Apache Software Foundation, we like to say, community over code, or community is more important than code. But of course, this is a complicated concept because it's not really that simple of prioritizing one over the other. And that's because Apache communities exist because of the code. So these two things are inextricably, inextricably linked. The community exists because of the code, and the code is able to flourish because of the community. And so you cannot have one without the other. 
At Apache, we do focus on the community because we believe that a healthy community leads to healthy development. So, how do you go about building community? And this is, of course, the center of my talk. Here's a few tips that I've learned over the past few years. The most important aspect of building community is transparency. Everything must be done where everyone can see it. Anything that happens in secret or in private excludes people. And more importantly, it tells them that they are less welcome than some others. And so in any community, and you've observed this in your family, your company, your group of friends, there's always an inner circle. But in an open project, what that inner circle does must be visible to everyone so that the people outside of that circle can understand how they might become more involved. They can watch what's happening. They can understand and participate in the conversation around what is happening. And they see a path where they might become part of that inner circle. Which leads me to my second point. There must be a path to full membership. So in this picture, you'll see something that you might see if you visit my home. This is the path behind my house that leads down to the stream, which is one of the places where we like to go and uh, spend our free time. In any community, beginners need to know that there is a path to greater involvement. The path must be discoverable, not hidden. Or most people will simply believe that they are forever on the outside. They won't see a way to become more involved. Clearly telling people how to become more involved and encouraging them to walk down that path is an essential part of gaining new community members. Community members must understand that there's a way to get from where they are to a place of deeper involvement. So you might want to document this, for example, say, after you successfully submit five code changes, we'll give you committer rights, for example. Or possibly, after you have participated on the mailing list for six months, we'll allow you greater involvement in the moderation of the discussion forums. All of these things give those potential contributors a clear way to get from where they are to where they want to be, and they don't feel like they're forever stuck in that one place. Now, another aspect of this is giving permission. So it's open source, and so by definition, everyone is permitted to participate. But not everyone feels invited, and people like to be asked. People like to be approached with a request to contribute. So here's what you need to do. You need to make it very clear that they are invited, that they are permitted and welcomed and encouraged to participate. Once people do start participating, you should celebrate it. You should mention on the mailing list, we have a new contributor and here's what they did for the project. And that lets that person know that their contribution was appreciated and that they are on that path to deeper connection with the project. Document the step-by-step -step process for participating. This serves two purposes. It shows them the path, but it also tells them that they are permitted to walk down it. It's not just a thing that they're allowed to look at and not touch. And it's also extremely important to remember that there are other kinds of contributions other than just code. They, uh, people might be welcome to participate in marketing or social media, event production. Graphic design is an important thing that a lot of people forget is a missing piece in many projects. Documentation is another place where almost anyone can contribute their experience for the benefit of the larger community. One critical thing that you can do to grow your user community is to ensure that 
a user's first experience is great. And of course, nobody starts out as a contributor, they start out as a user. So having a good initial experience with your project is the only way they're going to stick around long enough to become a contributor. Ensure that you have a detailed step-by-step -step instructions to take a new user from downloading the software to successfully using it that first time. Conduct extensive user testing on complete beginners and ensure that they can successfully get it working. While you're doing that, you can identify the places where the instructions are lacking or where the software itself is weak and fill in those details. Include lots of pictures in your documentation so people can know that they're on the right path and make sure that you update those instructions as the software evolves so that the instructions always match reality. This one can strike some people as a little unexpected, but uh, I do encourage you to have a code of conduct prominently displayed on your project page. Now, this doesn't mean we're going to punish people for bad behavior, but rather a code of conduct sends the message to potential contributors that you care about creating a welcoming space. Not having one signals the opposite, either that this is not a priority for you at all or that you simply haven't given it any thought. And the fact that you have thought about it is an enormous step towards creating that reality of a welcoming community. Realistically, these days, a lot of people will look for the code of conduct before they even look at your software because they understand that lacking one says something about your project. And sometimes people will simply move on to another project if they don't see that code of conduct displayed prominently. So you need to ensure that that's there, that it is enforceable, and we recommend that you base it on one of the uh, widely accepted codes of conduct that's out there, such as the Contributor Covenant. Actively welcome new contributors. I've touched on this a little bit before, but you'll find that in many open source projects, you know, some open source projects are actually hostile to beginners. A beginner will show up and they will get criticized for their ignorance. And that is, of course, completely unacceptable. But most projects are simply neutral. Beginners show up and they just ignore them. They expect them to be able to find their own way and they don't offer them any help. If your project actively welcomes beginners, they're much more likely to stick around. Uh, having somebody that's explicitly designated to this task can be really valuable in retaining new contributors. This can be as simple as sending a new contributor an email saying, we noticed that you are participating in the community now. Thank you. Welcome. We hope you come back. This can be a great way for someone to get involved as the welcome committee. Now, in the last decade, as open source software has moved to the GitHub model, it can be really easy for someone to make a pull request without ever talking to somebody, without ever engaging on the mailing list or the ticket tracker. They simply come and they submit a patch and they leave. And that reduces a potential sense of connectedness. At Apache, where the focus is largely on the community, then rather than on the code, we have the opportunity to create an environment where people want to belong. They want to be part of that inner circle and an explicit focus on this, an intentional welcoming of beginners can be very useful in making that happen. Consider creating a welcome packet. And by this, I mean a list of resources, which is documentation and uh, possibly uh, instructions for contributing and also where they can go for more help a list of volunteers that they can ask when they have questions, people who are willing and welcoming to take on a beginner and help them out on their early steps in the project. 
One critical aspect of welcome is respect. Now, if you've been involved in open source for very long, you have encountered people who treat beginners with contempt or possibly just ignoring them entirely. And this, once again, can lead to a situation where people don't feel like they are invited. They don't feel like they are ever going to graduate from being a beginner to being a contributor. You should intentionally look at beginners as though they might be the leaders someday, rather than that they will always be outsiders. This gives you the opportunity to consider where those people can contribute and encourage them into those roles. So treating beginners with respect from their very first encounter is really a critical part of growing your community over time. Now, one of the things that stands in the way of many of these uh, many of these techniques is that you're worried that someone will come into your project and break things. They will contribute code that doesn't work. They will cause you additional work. They will, in one way or another, make things not work as well because you have things working well with your small group of friends and you don't want somebody else to come in and ruin that. However, if you're doing open development correctly, there's almost no risk in inviting new contributors. Changes are not simply accepted blindly into the code base, but you have a review and an approval process. Mistakes can be prevented, and more importantly, when mistakes are discovered, they can be reverted, they can be removed back out of the code. These sort of safety nets, when you know you have these kinds of safety nets, it can make you more comfortable welcoming inexperienced contributors because you know that they can't break anything. You know that any damage is going to be very limited, very short term, and easy to revert. One of the caveats here, of course, is that you need to have community members who are willing to participate in those reviews. Otherwise, you'll end up with a whole stack of contributions that have come in that nobody has reviewed and no one has accepted. There is very little that's more discouraging to a beginner than making a pull request and having it be completely ignored. I hope that some of these tips are useful to you in building community around your project. There's no, there's no easy magic solution though, it's a lot of work. Building community is work. It's not something that just magically happens and it is something that you have to pay attention to every day because people will continue to come to your project and they will make a decision about whether they stay based on how they're treated that first day. So always keep your eyes open for the beginners and make sure that you treat them as potential leaders someday and welcome them to your community. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you for listening. My name is Rich Bowen, and I've put my email address and my Twitter account here on the screen. If you want to get in touch with me, if you have any further questions, I would be delighted to talk to you more. Thanks again, and I hope you enjoy this conference thoroughly.